Gait is quite simply a pattern of walking. Now, broadly speaking, gait's comprised of two bits. You have your swing phase and your stance phase. Now, the swing phase, as you would expect, is when your foot is swinging through the air. And then it really is up to the proximal muscles to control what your foot and ankle does. But the stance phase, and that's where it gets interesting, because that's when your foot's on the ground and you have to reverse your way of thinking. Because over here, you have to realize that now the foot is planted on the floor and the body's moving around the foot. So that's the way the muscles are working. And it's the stance phase today that I think we've got to talk about. Now, during gait, there's a lot of things that are happening all the time. And it's really complicated to make your head hurt. But one of the ways to simplify it is to think, right, let's just take things one plane at a time. And one of the simpler ways to do it is to think about it in the sagittal plane. And one of the ways in which we can think about certain aspects of gait in the sagittal plane is by considering what's been termed the rockers of gait. So if you see over here, we have a little graph which shows plant reflection at the top and dorsiflexion at the bottom. And then over time, what happens initially, you start off with a slightly neutral ankle, and then you have a little bit of dorsiflexion, and then you have a whole load of plant flexion. And then after that, your ankle dorsiflexes again, and then it comes up towards neutral. Now that looks like a bit of a waveform, and it's also quite complicated. But if you think about this as rockers, it really simplifies what's otherwise quite a confusing and slightly abstract subject. Right then, so there are three rockers described, as I said, and these are so-called because of the part of the anatomy which makes contact with the ground or around which is the movements occurring. And the three rockers are the heel rocker, the ankle rocker, and the forefoot rocker. Now, sometimes people refer to these as the first, second, and third rockers. And that's fine, but I prefer to avoid them and use the anatomical names for a few reasons. Firstly, in some patients, they may not have all three rockers. And so saying that the first rocker is missing and you start with the second rocker is a little bit strange. The other reason is that these rockers don't all happen in discrete intervals of time, and they may overlap somewhat. And therefore, I think it's more useful to anatomically describe them as the heel, ankle, and forefoot rocker. Now, I'm going to go through each of these in turn, and I'm going to describe what the rocker is, what the exact movement that occurs is, what the control of the movement is, and what some of the problems you may have with each of these if it goes wrong. The first one is the heel rocker, and this is what happens when the heel first makes contact with the ground. It's also often called the heel strike. Now, during this time, the toes are in the air and the ankle is dorsiflexed, and this helps you stop catching your foot on the ground, and it's an important part of the terminal part of swing phase. However, in order for the body to progress forward, there must be some movement at the ankle and the rest of the foot must make contact with the ground. And so this happens by allowing and controlling the ankle to move from a dorsiflex position to a neutral or even plantiflex position in a controlled manner. Now, the thing which allows this to happen is the eccentric contraction of the tibialis anterior muscle. Now, what is an eccentric contraction? Well, I'm sure you all know this, but just to recap, an eccentric contraction is one in which the muscle length actually gets longer as the contraction is occurring. And the way that happens is the number of fibers are contracted and some are relaxed. And then the contracted fibers hand off their contraction to the relaxed fibers, which become contracted, but at a slightly less degree of contraction. And so you get this little stochastic movement where you go down in one plane. And that's a really important type of um, contraction, which you must bear in mind because it's part of the first and the second rockers. Now, in a normal foot, this happens smoothly and progresses nicely. But if you have weakness of the tibialis anterior, then this eccentric contraction can't balance itself out and you actually get what's called a foot slapping gait because there's uncontrolled descent or plant deflection of the ankle once the heel hits the ground and the foot falls forward with a loud snap. Now, the important thing to know about this is that in order for that foot slap to happen, you need to have a power of about three out of five. So that's enough to overcome gravity and get your foot in the air, but not enough to control the descent. If you have power two or less, then you don't get a foot slapping gait because actually you can't clear the ground. So you either trip over or actually you use your proximal muscles to lift your foot up higher in the air to clear the ground. And that's a high stepping gait.
The next rocker is the ankle rocker. So after the foot has gone all the way down, the body needs to move forward. And when this happens, the torso moves forward and the foot stays planted where it is. Now during this time, the ankle has to dorsiflex. So if you remember on that graph, the dorsiflexion bit, that's what has to happen here. The ankle has to dorsiflex in order to accommodate that. But you don't just want to have unopposed dorsiflexion of the ankle because the whole body would just lurch forward then. So you need something to control that. And that is the soleus muscle. And again here, this is an eccentric contraction of the soleus muscle. So the muscle is getting longer as it contracts. So it controls the movement. Now this is really important because when you're walking, your heel remains planted on the floor. And so when the body is moving forward, any contraction of the soleus, which acts on the tibia, will act to arrest the forward momentum of the tibia and therefore pull the tibia back in relation to the body, which is otherwise moving forward. And that actually causes extension at the knee and reduces the amount of work that the quadriceps needs to do. Now, why is that important? Well, first of all, it is confusing and it is important to know that the soleus is an accessory extensor of the knee during gait. But the reason that it's important is because if someone has weak quadriceps, for example, a patient with cerebral palsy, then they may be at risk of a crouch gait. And if they had tight Achilles tendon, for example, which you were considering lengthening and you did not properly assess them, then lengthening the Achilles may weaken the Achilles and the soleus, and this eccentric contraction may not be able to occur. They therefore may not be able to pull their tibia back and therefore they may actually develop a crouch gait because their quadriceps isn't strong enough to straighten their knee while walking. And so you may actually make their gait worse. So the last rocker is the forefoot rocker. And eventually the stance phase must complete and you must go into the swing phase. But in order to do that, the heel and then the foot must leave the ground. So here we have our first concentric of a muscle and again it's the gastrocoeliac complex. So the gastrocoeliac now switches from eccentric to concentric, the forefoot remains planted and the heel leaves the ground and your body rocks forward in the forefoot, hence the term forefoot rocker. Now in a concentric contraction the fibers progressively shorten and that's the classic contraction that we're used to and familiar with. So what are the problems associated with this? Well if you have a weak gastrocoeliac either because of a neurological or muscular disorder, or perhaps you've got an Achilles red tendon rupture, which has healed over long or not healed at all, then your push-off will be ineffective. And in this case, the patient has poor propulsion and they often need to drag their foot from behind them rather than propulse off effectively. So there you have it. That's a very short explanation of the three rockers, the heel rocker, the ankle rocker, and the forefoot rocker. Feel free to watch the video again because these are difficult concepts and it's important that you understand it properly. I would also advise you to go out to your patients and watch their gait, observe their rockers, because it's only after you've observed enough normal rockers that you'll be able to identify one which is abnormal. And remember, this often comes up in the exams. In fact, the patient who's got missing rockers because of successful ankle fusion is actually an exam favorite. Good luck.